President Obama will deliver his second State of the Union address tomorrow night. Thanks to the midterm elections last November, the president will face a more hostile crowd this year than in his previous addresses to a joint session of Congress. In just the first few weeks of the 112th session of Congress, Republicans in the House have repealed the president's signature health reform law, pledged to defund the Environmental Protection Agency, threatened to not increase the debt ceiling, and vowed to not approve any new spending. So as the president remedies, or excuse me, readies for an address to tout his accomplishments thus far and call for new investments in job, infrastructure, and technology to keep America competitive around the world, what can we expect from the GOP? The Republicans and Democrats more deeply divided than in any other time in our nation's history. Divides that surely won't be bridged by the two parties sitting together tomorrow night. Is it possible for President Obama's message and agenda to be heard? Here to offer a unique perspective on the upcoming State of the Union address is former Republican Congressman from Ohio, Bob Ney. Congressman Bob Ney, welcome. Hi, Tom. How are you? Great to have you with us. Good to uh, be here. You've, uh, f for our listeners who don't perhaps know, you've, you've had this wild ride from member of Congress to friend of Jack Abramoff to prison to last week hanging out with the Dalai Lama in Dharamsala, India. Uh, to our show, and I and and we've known each other for a few years. I, yes. We should, you know, as a matter of disclosure, as a former super insider. First of all, let's talk about politics first. For, what do you expect from the State of the Union address? Well, you know, tomorrow night's prom night, yeah. political prom night. They're going to be sitting <laughs> together, and and that's nice in itself. But that doesn't mean there'll be uh, civility after that. Doesn't mean that they're going to work together. I mean, it's a great step in, in yeah. all seriousness. But uh, tomorrow the president's going to focus on job creation because he, he has to. It's the, you know, the economy and he cares about it. Uh, he's also going to address uh, the, the situation of doing something with the deficit but in a prudent way, in a measured way because you know, this didn't happen overnight and it's not just this administration that's uh, added to the deficit or just this Congress. It started when I was there and with, with Bush. So he's going to he's going to we'll mention start that. Reagan. Well, yeah, well, we, can, mean, we, we can wait your way back. Uh, but he's going to uh, mention that. And then the third element is going to be, you know, what's he going to do? New. And some of it you'll see drift towards. This will be the controversial part, I think. A stimulus two package, education, transportation. But uh, the message is going to be one of, of bipartisan from the president. Let's see. Besides sitting next to each other on this political prom night, let's see what they actually do afterwards. And there are examples. Uh, Steny Hoyer, when I worked with Steny, he could have politicized every single hour after 911 and the decisions we, have, we had to make. Steny Hoyer didn't do that. He put the institution first. So there are people that can do this. There's got to be the will to do it, not just the rhetoric. Right. Yeah. And, and that's what, and in fact, Congressman Ryan and Congresswoman Bachman are going to be giving post State of the Union speeches. To what extent, I mean, Paul, Ryan wants to totally privatize Social Security and basically blow up Medicare, roll back the New Deal. Bachman wants to do that and make sure everybody in Minnesota is armed and dangerous, her phrase. To what extent do these guys, I mean, you know, men and women, represent the Republican Party? Well, they're not going to be representative of the Republican Party in the sense that they can uh, give a speech tomorrow night and all the Republicans in the nation are going to say, wow, that's, that's it. That's, that's not necessarily going to be the, uh, the way. It's, it's a communication deal. Uh, Bachman, of course, has a lot of notoriety, as you know. Uh, Ryan has now attained a position that's important, which is the budget position. But I think that today the, the American electorate on both sides of the aisle are, and I'm not going to say fickle, uh, that might not be flattering, but they're, they're fluid. Mm -hmm. and, and just as quickly as they ushered in change this year, in two years they can usher it out with another Congress. And they could also, in all theory, uh, keep President Obama as president. Yeah. You were recently a pretty major character in a movie called Casino Jack, which Louise and I went to see here at the E Street Cinema a couple of weeks ago. And I recommend to everybody, if it's still playing, you know, find it. And if it's not, figure out how to get it on DVD or something. It's the story of Jack Abramoff. How did you hook up with Jack Abramoff, and, 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 and what happened? Well, Jack was a, a big-time player, and, and I did a documentary myself, Alex Gibney, wonderful uh, Casino Jack, United States of Money, and this is the Spacey film version. But Jack Abramoff was, was the player, just as we have in the lobby communities, Democrat, Republican, and he was close to Tom DeLay. And people said to me, if you ever want to achieve anything, if you want to you know, you know, run for a higher uh, level, I was chairman of the committee, uh, you, you kind of got to smooth over some things with delay. I'm a, look, I'm a, a union uh, supporting Republican, always have. Yikes. 
<laughs> squishy, my friend said, you know. But I, I did, and so a friend suggested, hey, you know, one of the things is you advance, get to know Abramoff, and you'll get to know DeLay and his inner circle. And of course, Mike Scanlon was working for him at the time, et cetera. So that's what initially began the, uh, the path. And, and that led ultimately led to your to, ending up As in we jail. called it federal prison, and we like to call it lovingly the Bush housing program. I see. <laughs> okay. How come Ralph Reed, uh, you know, what was his role in all this? Uh, he, he's a prominent character in the movie as well, the Casino Jack movie, and I'm astounded that he's not in prison. How did that, you know, how did, why isn't he? What, what, well, how did he avoid all that? Jack went to prison, I went to prison, and every dirty person was caught, just the two of us. In this town, right. You're, yeah, okay. But uh, I get it. I, with Ralph Reed, I, you know, there were so many inner, inner workings there and connections. A lot of it I wasn't aware of, but it's a question I'm asked quite a lot, frankly. I don't know the insides, but you know, he was definitely absolutely involved. Very interesting with with uh, with his situation. Never called upon by the Senate. I'd pose that question hmm. as to why. To testify. To, to, yeah, to explain to, himself. To be explained. Uh, yeah. With the Senate. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who's a member of Congress. And, or who was a member of Congress, I, I should call him more an acquaintance, somebody I've known for a number of years, but not super, super well. But um, he shared this story with me last year. Uh, after the Citizens United decision, that was in January, and this is probably around May, and he said that a fellow came to him and said, I got about a quarter million bucks I'm going to drop into, the, into a campaign in your district. I can use it to build you up or I can use it to destroy you. Didn't ask for anything didn't ask even for a response, just dropped that. I think if he had gone any farther, he might have broken a law. Um, and that was one of the things that caused my friend to not run for Congress again. He just, you know, he's not a congressman this year. And it almost seems like with Citizens United now and, and businessmen able to say that kind of thing or billionaires able to say that kind of thing, that you don't even need lobbyists anymore to go through to get to members of Congress. I mean, are we seeing a a change in the dynamic of how Congress is influenced? Oh, it, it has been changed. Look, McCain-Feingold was going to end all this money. It, right. This money is going on and it's multiplying itself. Uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, Jack Abramoff, look, he made mistakes, I made mistakes, all right? But that's not the whole, uh, you know, two apples rotted in the barrel. The barrel's bad mm -hmm. in D.C. It's been bad. This money's out there. I, I've had people in the past that have told me, and these were not lobbyists, by the way, that said, you know, I'm upset with you. I don't like your position on some of the coal issues, and I'm, I'm going to take you out. There'll be a quarter of a million laid against you. I've had that stated to me in wow. the past. So it's out there, and there's all kinds of groups. This is pre-Citizens United. Obviously. This is pre, yeah, yeah pre-Citizens United. So I, I think the transparency is going to be critical. Uh, we need to know every single person that's contributing, uh, who they're giving to. Uh, but the system has not changed. It's just, you know, people feel a little bit comfortable. A few people. Democrats, you know, Nancy Pelosi got the Disclose Act through the House of Representatives that would have required disclosure of all money spent on a campaign. Period, mm -hmm. even if it didn't go through a campaign. The Republicans filibustered it in the Senate, and 59 votes to block that filibuster, one vote short. But it was the Republican Party in lockstep. How is it that corruption in our government has become a partisan issue? And why is it that it seems like the Republican Party is all in favor of it, and the Democrats, by and large, are opposed to it? Well, or, am I, I, or am I being too simplistic here? Well, I think there's problems on both sides of the aisle. I think there's Democrats uh, that create problems, and there's Clearly. Republicans too, you know, both sides of the aisle. Uh, but the issue remains, I think, in my mind, very clear. Who could oppose full disclosure? Why not have full disclosure? So if the Republicans have went against that, bad tactic. They it, ran against it, it as this is more government bureaucracy. And it's not. It's transparency. So, yeah, people made mistakes both sides of the aisle, but transparency, if they're blocking transparency, uh, it's not going to be favorable to the electorate. Yeah, well, it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how many people figure this out. What do people not know about how Congress works that they should know, American citizens? I think that, first of all, on a, on a positive side, members work a lot. They don't just eat dinner all day long or, or lunch. They, they work very hard. A lot of members do. But I think that the, the people need to know, many times they call a member's Congress, a, a, a member's office, and it doesn't mean that this happens all the time, and the, the issue doesn't get to the member. The word doesn't get to the member. The opinion doesn't get to the member. There's a lot of, of staff shenanigans, I'll, I'll tell you, that are out there, and a lot of good staffers, but a lot of sh staff shenanigans, things are sheltered from the member. So I think that whole direct link 
has been lost so much. So how uh, members are very regulated. She's showing up at, uh, at events in the district or going to, to events. I doors? think, he, and believe it or so not, he, hand write a letter. Oh, really? Because emails are coming in, tens of thousands, they can't open them all. Hand write a letter, send it to the district office, put on it personal, very sensitive. The staff's afraid to open it. Oh, really? They think it might be from an old girlfriend or maybe. <laughs> oh, jeez. Should we have public financing of campaigns? Do you think that that's the solution to money, this problem of money in politics right now? When McCain-Feingold came around, if you'd asked me this question, I said, absolutely not. The public financing is against constitutional law. Uh, and, and, and Alex Gibney's work, Casino Jack, you know, I, I talk about it in there. I, I believe uh, we need public financing. We have constitutional issues, but there's still ways you can limit the, amount, the amounts of outside money so you don't get groups from both sides of the aisle pouring in tons of money. But I think public financing needs to be broached. I think it's, it's got to be a better thing to look at, uh, an issue to look at, than what we're doing now because yeah. the money's just multiplying, Tom. You know, and I oh, know it's it. the curve is like this. Yeah, and the it's public incredible. doesn't realize some of it. Maybe. Bob Nay, thanks Thank so you, much Tom. for being with thanks. us tonight. It's been great to see you.